Welcome to the New Abbey YouTube channel. We are a Jesus community telling the biggest story of God in Los Angeles, and we're excited that you're joining the conversation with us today. Enjoy. So at New Abbey, we believe in conversations, and we want to facilitate that with one another. So if you find three or four or five people around you, if you feel safe, if you're an introvert, you got this, we can do this together, it's okay. Extroverts, try to listen a little bit. It's gonna be an opportunity for you as well. Uh, and we have this question to start with. In what ways has your faith evolved? You've got three minutes and 54 seconds. Enjoy. One of the things that I love about our community is we always just want to name the thing and talk about it. Sometimes in the world of church or the world of Christianity or the world of faith, there are these things that are right in front of us and we just don't honestly talk about it. We're like, why do we do that? Or why is that thing important? Or maybe when you ask a question about something that you believed or who God is or what the Bible is, people would give you like funny answers. Did anybody grow up in the world when you're like, but the people on the islands, do they go to hell? And then like the Sunday school teacher's like, yes, they do. And you're like, okay, that's weird. That's really weird. And so we want to ask better questions instead of having just better answers. And so much of our faith is rooted in this idea of evolution. The world of faith that we've been given in Christianity is not evolution, but instead it's been things like absolutes, certitude, immovable objects, and sometimes that's how we see God. But what we want to think about over these next few months as we're in this series of you've heard it said, but I say to you, is that's a beautiful phrase by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount about evolution, that Jesus is admitting there's a way that you've seen things. There's a narrative that you've been given. There's a story about God and humanity and the Bible and faith that you have been told, but I say to you. What if it actually looks like this? What if it's no longer like that? What if we still use some of these things, but what if the thing grows and gets bigger and more interesting and it evolves and there's a larger story for us to live into? That the Sermon on the Mount is an invitation of Jesus to say, yes, there are some traditions and some things that we have been given that are beautiful and we don't need to throw them all out. And the world has grown. The world is changing. There's new ways to see God and our humanity. And Jesus invites us into the story. So today we want to think about this idea that the evolution of the Bible is a necessary part of our faith. That we need to see the Bible as something that evolves in order for our own faith and our own humanity to evolve. And so in order to do that, we got to do some things. We're going to talk about the disease of death, and if we can do that, then we can look at the book of Genesis, and if we can do that, then hominins, my friends, you know, bipedal, featherless creatures that were once human beings that no longer live on planet Earth. Say more, Corey, that this happened before or after the flood. I'll get to it. <laughs> mission statement. That's like such a cheesy church joke. Okay, mission statement. Then if we can do mission statement, then we're going to go on to the Sermon on the Mount. If we can understand the Sermon on the Mount, then, of course, we're going to look at the life of Jesus, and then, of course... The NFL. And if we can understand, there you go. It's like seven fantasy football fans here. Everyone else is like, this is horrible. All right, then we're going to talk about eternally true. And if we can do that, then we are in the middle of high Jewish holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Teshuvah, this word for forgiveness, and then Yom Kippur is coming up next week. And then, of course, 9-11. So in order to think about the evolution of the Bible as necessary for our faith, I want to think about things from 30,000 feet at a little bit higher of an elevation and altitude, and I want to get incredibly practical. And as we get practical, then we'll talk about this idea of how remembrance and practice are an important part of our journey as human beings, but we need to get there. There's a Harvard professor named David Sinclair, and he is working on something incredibly important. He's working on this idea of how we understand death, because last year, about 650,000 people died from COVID, Another 600,000 people died from smoking. Uh, about a million and a half people died from heart disease. And about a million and a half people died from cancer. But there is something that kills more people every year than all of those things. Does anybody know? What was it? Accidents? Anything else? Anyone else? What kills more people every year? Depression. Depression? Old age is the answer. It kills more people every year than anything else. 
And so David Sinclair has looked at death as a disease. He says, why is it that we accept that old age is something that should kill us? Say more. You've heard that it said that when you get old, you die. But I say unto you, we have science now. And so David Sinclair has been doing all of these studies on mammals and looking at different mammals that are cousins of one another. For example, the blind mole rat, we don't know if it dies. I know, Google it, have fun, people. I'm just giving you golden candy on a Sunday morning. You're welcome. Like most other rodents, most other rodents live like two to four years, but the blind mole rat, sometimes we'll find it like 35 years old. The only thing that we know that kills it is predators. Why? Humpback whales, blue whales, gray whales live to be about 80 years old, but the right head whale, 230 years old. I know. The crazy thing about it is, why? What happened in their genetic mutation where their similar mammalian cousins live a certain age, but they get to live so much longer? So Harvard scientists are looking at the genes that we have, and they're finding and splicing the genes that would allow us to live longer. Not only are they splicing those genes to allow us to live longer, they're also creating genes that allow us to reverse our age. So what they're doing with those genes is they're putting a credit score around those genes. That your lifespan, your genes are their healthiest between 20 and 30 years old. Around after that time, you begin to age in a different way. And so what they're doing is they're taking the cells in your body when you're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and they're turning back time so that your cells begin to look like 20 and 30 year olds. And they're already doing this in rodents. They've taken rodents that are completely blind, cannot see, and they've been using this gene mutation in their eyes, and all of a sudden these blind rodents can now see. Amen. Some of you are like, I'm terrified. I hope Kurt Cameron is right. Other people are like, man, I can't wait to live on Mars with Elon Musk. Let's do this thing. I know. So the technology is already out there, and they are pinpointing different parts of our body. They're renewing livers. They're renewing hearts. They're renewing lungs. They're renewing skin. And now they're beginning to put all of it together. And within three years, we're going to start to do human trials. So here's what this means for you single people out there. You're going to be at a bar one night. You're going to say, okay, what's your name? They tell you their name. How old are you? 87. Weird. Weird. You didn't see that coming. Man, who's that haughty 28-year-old? No, 87 year old. They fought in World War II, right? It's going to blow your mind a little bit. This is not made up science fiction, people. They are creating it right now. How are they funding this, you might ask yourselves. Tech billionaires do not want to die. And that's how they are funding it, literally. They're like, honestly, we have more money than we've ever needed. So you have heard that it was said that death is the thing that kills you because when you're 80 years old, I guess you die. But I say unto you, we're going to live into a world where some people live to be 150 and 200 years old. How do we make sense of the Bible when the very world that we're living in is evolving at such a rapid rate? That for us, if we continue to see faith in God and the Bible as something that is stagnant and concrete and immovable, then we will not be able to adequately be able to participate in the healing of this world. If we are spending our time over here trying to argue with science, trying to argue with reality, trying to argue about like random things that Adam and Eve really have belly buttons, you're just having giant conversations and missing the point. Because the world is already evolving. And your view of God can be, God is somehow terrified about this changing world and can't wait to burn it up, which is an unhealthy theology. Or, of course, God is already ahead of this evolution. God is very aware of where humanity is going and who humanity is. And so we can ask ourselves, does the Bible fit with the narrative that we have for the world? Well, Corey, this is beginning to sound a little bit like relativism. Can we just use the Bible however we want and change it in the ways that we need to to fit our understanding and our sociological place in reality and time and history? Yeah, basically, that's what we're going to do. And that's what everyone has done for thousands of years. Bear with me. Some of you are in the end of like, thank God he's saying this. Some of you are like, my grandma's not going to let me come to this church anymore. <laughs> Let's do a little bit of work with one another. If you lived just a few hundred years ago, you would have understood the stories of Genesis, specifically Genesis 1 through 11, pretty literally or allegorically, actually really literally. 
If you would have gone a thousand years ago, you would have understood the book of Genesis allegorically. You would have understood it's conveying a truth, but it's not literal. That's not me saying this. Famous church fathers like Augustine would say we should read this story allegorically. It wasn't until the scientific revolution, when the church was nervous that they were losing their power in this world, that they began to change the creation stories to literal, because we were scared that science was moving too fast for the church. And so the first story of creation is actually Genesis 2. You wouldn't have known that information even 200 years ago, because we didn't have anthropological studies yet. You're welcome. I got to anthropological studies on a Sunday. Amen. Amen. Because we didn't do archaeological digs, we couldn't find older texts that were out there of our same scriptures. And so we didn't always know what was going on in the scriptures, and so we interpreted them in different ways. What I'm saying is we just have different information now than we had 200 years ago. Here's what that means. The oldest book or the oldest story in Genesis would be Genesis 2, which is a story about Adam and Eve naming all of the animals in the garden, right? Well, why? Because in the ancient world, during an agrarian revolution, when you are now mastering, domesticating, and dominating animals and plants and seeds, you are telling yourself creation stories about God is giving you these things to thrive in the world. Later on, we would get the story of Genesis 1. We wouldn't have known that until a couple hundred years ago, that these stories were older and that these stories were younger. We just didn't have evidence for these things. And so then later on, we find the stories of Genesis 1, even though it's the first story in the Bible, confusing, I know, but it was really the second creation story. If you're keeping up with me, raise your hand. For the rest of you, pancakes are coming soon, I promise. <laughs> Genesis 1 is the story where we see that there's this creator God who creates the universe, and the universe is good. And so what we know now is that about the year 500 BCE, that the Israelites were living in exile in Babylon. And there was a Babylonian creation story that was about those gods named Marduk and a bunch of other names that you can Google later if you care at all. But the point of those stories is that those gods were incredibly violent. And those gods saw humanity in a really low way. The human beings were just slaves and servants to the divine. And so the creation story of Genesis 1 comes along, and the Jews begin to tell a bigger story about who God is. And in this story, God doesn't see us as slaves and servants. God sees us as made in God's image. We didn't know that Genesis 1 was a retelling of the Babylonian creation story until we did archaeological digs in Babylon some 200 years ago. So that means there was thousands of years of interpretation of a certain part of the Bible that we didn't know how those stories got there, not because God was lying to us, not because we were bamboozled, not because it's evil to change your view or perspective or interpretation of Scripture, because we just didn't have information. Now we do have information, and now the story gets to evolve for us in a different way. So now Genesis 1, from the best scholarship and archaeological evidence we have is a story about the Jews saying all of the other cultures of the world are trying to say to be human is less than and that we're worthless in this world. But this story of the God that we serve, this God who liberates, this God who cares about the marginalized, this God who's always on the side of the little people, this is a story where God says everybody is made in my image. The story evolves in a powerful way. And then many of you in this room, you've been told the story about Genesis 3, which is somewhere back there, belly buttonless human beings and a magical snake and a magical fruit tree made some choices, and we are all suffering for that for the rest of time. That thought in itself is rather new to Protestant thinking in a certain way. And here's why I have evidence for that. The rest of the Old Testament never talks about Genesis 1 through 11 ever. That's weird. You would think that if the story of Jesus coming into the world is to deal with the fact that some people ate some magical fruit, that the rest of the Bible would talk about it more often. You would think that Jesus would say, I came today because they ate the fruit. <laughs> Never says it. I came to bleed out on a cross because you're horrible sinners. Never says it. Talks about, I came to show you this kingdom of God. I came to show you a different reality. I came that you might have life, life abundantly. 
And that life abundantly is not something about later. I came so that now you would realize that you're made in the image of God. Now you would thrive. Now, whether you're male or female or Jew or Greek, right, or master or servant, now you would thrive. What a radical, revolutionary story that Jesus is telling. My point is this. Throughout time, at different places, you have heard it said. And so in this time and place, in 2021, we have fancy language. We call it construction and deconstruction and reconstruction. And what I'm trying to say is that this construction and deconstruction and reconstruction has been going on for thousands of years. And so now our opportunity is to resist where the stream is flowing or to say we can participate in a story of good news, a story of Jesus, and actually utilize the Bible that can work in 2021 when you go to a bar and meet an 87-year-old hottie. I brought that full circle. I know. And so the evolution of the Bible is important for us, that we don't need to be scared when we're hearing larger, more robust understandings of Scripture, because those larger, more robust understandings of Scriptures have always been happening amongst our tradition of faith. How do I know this even more? Look at Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Follow along with me in Matthew chapter 5. No? Good? Good? No, not here. Also don't have my phone on me or my Bible, so great. I'm just going to tell you it. Here we go. Uh, Matthew 5 is a story that goes like this. I need my phone. Um, (laughs) Jesus has just got through going through the Beatitudes. I'm good. I really do got it. And Jesus talks about, you know, blessed are the meek and blessed are the poor. And then he gets to this part uh, right before he begins this teaching in, in, in Matthew 5.22 where he says, you've heard it said, but then I say to you. And Jesus will repeat it six times, and he'll talk about things like, money and power and killing and language and all this other powerful stuff. But in Matthew 5, right before he he, he gets there, he says, now if any of you even take one little detail out of the law, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. But Corey, I thought you just said, and if you fulfill all of the law, then you'll inherit the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. And uh, Jesus talks in this way because he says, now if any of you are not understanding the law as much as the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, then you don't inherit it. Like, man, that's incredibly strong language by Jesus. It is, but here's what it means. Jesus is actually flipping the script in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. He's saying, it's actually the teachers of the law that are abusing and using the scriptures for their own sake of power. And so what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to live into a righteousness that is not about your capacity to memorize Bible verses, but it's about your ability to live out this way of faith. So Jesus talks about righteousness in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. He will end the Sermon on the Mount in this idea of, if you have heard these words of mine and you put them into practice, if you actually put them into practice, if you're actually utilizing them, then you are like a house that was built on rock. And if you don't utilize them, and if you don't practice it, then you are like a house that is built on sand. What Jesus is saying is this. The scriptures are still important if you put them into practice. The scriptures are useless if you're just using them to have power over other people. And we have lived in a world, particularly in Western Christianity, evangelicalism, and particularly Protestantism, where we have so valued and venerated the Bible that we have all of these things where we teach people to memorize the Bible and to memorize scripture and to know more about it and to know the Greek and the Hebrew, but it doesn't matter if you're practicing and living it out. And Jesus is only interested in practitioners. Jesus never asked you to believe in him or to worship him. Jesus asked you to follow him, which is interesting enough. Jesus is saying, I want you to follow this way of life. And so he'll use this phrase, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. There's a certain way that you've heard talked about the Bible, but I want to open it up in a bigger way. And here's why. Jesus isn't trying to give us weird, arbitrary lists for what it means to be human. Jesus is trying to give us a way of life, trying to utilize the scriptures so that it actually makes a difference in your life as a human being. So as a kid, maybe you were told the story of Jonah. And the story of Jonah that most of us were given is that you need to believe that there was a man who was swallowed by a large fish, and that was a miracle of God, and if you believe in that, then you know the scriptures are true. Something like that? 
that has nothing to do with what the story of Jonah is about. The story of Jonah is about loving your enemies. The power of the Bible is that it's true, not literal. When we see it as just literal, we miss the ability to follow and practice the way of Jesus because the world will evolve. There are things that are, can be literal in the story, obviously. You know, to show all my cards, I believe in a literal resurrection of Jesus. Other people and progressives and liberals today, and they're like, who could believe in that? A Jewish, whatever, great. I'm here to say that, that the way, the things that we believe and what we follow will change our practices, and those practices change is what will change the way that we heal and participate in the world. You may think about the, tori- the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Maybe that's a story for you where, you know, all of these people built a tower that's so big, and then God dispersed them around the world, and that's how we've got different languages. That's called a giant conversation of missing the point. The story of the Tower of Babel is a story of truth that's asking the question is, sometimes it's too far, too far. Sometimes should we ask moral and ethical questions before we take our next steps, technologically even. The power of these stories still have something true for us in every single generation. They are eternally true. What Jesus is leading us to in the Sermon on the Mount is this story, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. There's a reason that this story is true in every generation. There's a reason that when we practice this way of God, it's here that we have the ability to change the world in a different way. More examples of this for you. Do we have any of the scriptures, by the way, that came on here? Do we have the Luke scripture? Yeah? Great, let's use the Luke scripture. Sweating. When Jesus first enters into a synagogue, he reads this verse from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Pause there a second. These are the words that Jesus reads about himself when he goes into a synagogue to declare, this is the work that I have come to do. It's about, can you keep it back up there for me? It's about the proclamation of prisoners. It's about good news for the poor. It's about people seeing. It's about caring for the marginalized. Remember, do you ever hear like around people and they're like, you're just telling a social gospel? You mean like Jesus? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the thing that I'm doing. And everything I'm saying to you is that even Jesus edited and redacted scripture. There's a final part of this verse that's right here in Isaiah, and the day of vengeance of our God to come for all who mourn. Jesus ends reading the scroll there for a reason. Because Jesus wants us to see the evolution of the Bible. That so often, have you, did any of you grow up in a world where you told that every scripture is equally true, every single part of it? Even Jesus wouldn't agree with that statement. That Jesus is trying to show us the scriptures themselves as this beautiful evolutionary document that we dance with. It takes two steps forward and it takes one step back. And in the evolution of the biblical narrative, it's there that we find freedom and it's there that we understand what it means to be human. The NFL. I was thinking about the NFL yesterday because my son, my oldest son loves football right now. I haven't thought or cared about football in like seven years. Anyone care about football? All right, eight of us, the rest of you, okay. And he's asking me all of these rules about football, and football is this incredibly complex game. And there's all these moving and working parts, and they got to work together. And I'm like, what if we, I taught him about football, and I just gave him, like, the history of football. And I just said, okay, well, there's a Vince Lombardi, and these were the Green Bay Packers, and this is what happens. My wife's a Packers fan, that's for you. Mwah. And then, you know, there's also a way of believing about football called the Dallas Cowboys, no need to mention any further. And then there's marginalized communities like the LA Chargers, right? You know, there's things like that in the, in the NFL. And so it's not helpful to just talk about the history of football. You have to go play football to understand it. And everything that Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he's trying to move people away from a world and a system where they just talked about faith. And Jesus is trying to get people into a way of practice and into a way of being. What I love right now about the high holy Jewish holiday season, Rosh Hashanah, is that it's a season of remembrance and then practice. That Judaism still has so much to offer us. 
that Judaism is what Jesus was. Jesus was a Jew who understood the beauty of his faith well, and Jesus very much cared about the rituals and scriptures that he was given. But Jesus cares that those rituals and that those scriptures were put into practice in a way that's powerful and meaningful. And so Rosh Hashanah is a celebration of the Jewish New Year, and it's a celebration of the creation of the world. And during Rosh Hashanah, like any New Year celebration around the world, it's an opportunity for you to reflect on the previous year. It's also an opportunity for repentance. The word for repentance is teshuva. Teshuva means a return to something. It's an opportunity as you eat all of these specific foods, as you remember the stories of creation, as you remember that God is birthing new things into the world continually, that you take deep stock of your life and you say, where are the areas that I need to return to my truest self? What are the things that I've been living into that don't represent fully who I am? And Rosh Hashanah is this powerful moment where you do it with your community of faith, where the word repentance or forgiveness doesn't become scary, but it's this reminder of returning to who he's always been. It's an opportunity to say, there's been some stuff that I'm doing in my life for the last year, and I need to cut that shit out because there's some other stuff that I need to do in my life. That's going to go on one of those Christian memes. I know it. They're going to find me for that one. I got hit last time for saying that. And there's 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. And these 10 days are used for the Jewish community of a moment of remembrance and reflection and so that you can set your life ready for the next year so that you can pick up some ways of practice. What I care about New Abbey is this. I care that we evolve in our understanding of God and our understanding of faith and how we relate and experience Jesus And what I care about is that as those things evolve within us, that we would pick up new practices. I will be so dismayed that if we're a community of people that just ideologically shuffles things around and we just participate with cynicism and anger and debating people on the internet and we're just challenging beliefs of Aunt Barb, what good will that get us? It will get us somewhere if we say, I've challenged all of these things, I've deconstructed these things because I've taken my faith so seriously. I take so seriously that the world is evolving that I want to reflect, repent, renew, remember, take on some new rituals and practices in a way that allow me to live into the world in a way that's actually going to be meaningful. Because to be honest, I don't want to lose this way of Jesus. To be honest, I still want to experience relationship with God. To be honest, even though the Bible is fascinating to me and it's interesting and it's getting bigger and I'm working with it, it still matters and it's mattered to billions of people over thousands of years because it's eternally true. Not because every single part of it is literal, but because there's truth in it that works for every single generation and that matters to me. And so we want to be people who live into the powerful rituals and traditions that we have And those rituals and traditions also will shape the practices that we have. So we come into a space like this, and we have these conversations so that we can remember well the people of God that we want to be. And then we get back into conversations so that we can reflect and think and make a new way of life and pick up some practices so that we can leave this place and go participate in the healing of the world in a new way. And so I don't know what that thing will be for you, but my challenge to all of us is, Will we allow the evolution of our faith to be put into practice so that we can participate in the healing of the world in a new way? Maybe for you that means I'm just going to start reading the stories of Jesus again. Maybe for some of you is I'm going to participate in simple prayers where I just say, God, I'm here. Or God, I love you. Or God, I need you. God, would you be with me? Maybe it means that as we worship in this space, it's a reminder that worship to God is more than singing songs for 20 minutes on a Sunday morning. Maybe it's a reminder of what are the other places in my life where I can see the wonder and the mystery and awe and the beauty of God in everything that I do. Maybe I need to start taking myself on a hike once a week because it's there that I see the beauty of God. Maybe I'm going to join that water pastel class because for the love of God, Bob Ross. Maybe... I'm going to go start taking myself to a fine dinner once a week just so I can see that the beauty that is in food that is well thought of and that God put this entire world together. Maybe I'm going to start being honest and vulnerable with some friends in ways that I haven't before because the truth is about my life. I don't know if I feel seen or known. 
Maybe I'm going to go find a therapist because there are things that I want to work out. There's a whole new way of being a person that I no longer want to be anymore. And in this new creation of world, in this new narrative that I'm understanding about my faith and the evolution that I'm having, I know that God has more for who I am, and I want to fully live into that image. There's a million different practices that you could take on, but would you leave this place today just thinking about one thing that you can take with you? One thing that you could participate in each day that would allow you and open you up to a greater evolution of God and faith and the Bible and the story that we're living into with one another. You're going to find three or four people around you, and we're going to answer this question with one another. How can you practice evolving your faith? Enjoy. Enjoy.